Welcome. Today's lesson is entitled Trigonometric Functions of Any Angle. It is time for us to move beyond the unit circle and right triangles and explore the most comprehensive definitions of our six trig ratios and to get a further understanding of the behavior of those six ratios. So we'll go ahead and start with a little review at the top, just um, kind of a continuation of the previous notes worksheet. Here's what I have on my paper, and let's get this on yours as well. So every angle has six ratios that correspond to it. So it's good for us to kind of get this in one more time. Perfect. And what we're going to be taking a look at is the value, of course, of those six ratios. And so the values of each one of those really are based on or dependent on three things. And we referred to this in the last one, are based on what I would call the horizontal distance from the origin. So the horizontal distance we know of as, of course, x. The vertical distance from the origin, we obviously know that as y. And then what I would call the, the direct distance. And that would be kind of the radius of the circular motion of our angle, so the direct distance, and therefore would be r. So x, y, and r. Excellent. Now we again, we ended our last notes worksheet dealing with the definitions for these six trig ratios, but it, they are quite important for our purposes, so let's get them in a second time here. And uh, I'll go ahead and start with the sine ratio of any angle. Is based on two of those three components, of course. Remember sine ratio as y to r. Just make sure you have that piece really firmly implanted in your mind there. Cosine ratio, of course, is the x to r ratio on the angle. The tangent ratio of theta is the y to x ratio. None of this should be brand new. Again, we've been kind of building up to these moments. One piece at a time. Now kind of dealing with the secondary ratios, the cosecant. Cosecant, remember, is the reciprocal of sine, so r over y. Secant, of course, as the reciprocal of cosine, so r over x. And last but not least here, cotangent ratio as the reciprocal of tangent, so x over y. Again, really please make sure you know those extraordinarily well as we will be utilizing those and, again, really looking at the behavior of those values as our angles change. We really start that process today. Now, we've been focusing a lot so far in this unit on the unit circle and right triangle trigonometry, and obviously these ratios are corollary to that. So what I'm going to do is literally just take a moment just to make the connection because I'm not doing anything new. I'm just extending the process from these pieces right here. And so if it's okay with you, what I'd have you do just on your paper, as fast as can be, is just draw yourself a unit circle. Looks something like that right there. Here's our one, zero. Excellent. And we don't have to be so specific about this. We've done this before. Here's our point on the unit circle. Obviously, that point has an X and a Y. And we called this our T value there. And t, if you remember, represented how far we move around the unit circle, or it also represented the angle measurement in radians. On the unit circle, they are the same. That's what makes the unit circle so visually powerful. Okay, and the reason that was happening is because the radius of the circle was 1. So if you can fit all that in there, so be it. Now, again, what made that unit circle so visually appealing was when I started to talk about the sine ratio, cosine ratio, and tangent ratio of t, you could see that the sine ratio, as we defined as y, really represents on the unit circle y over 1, right? And isn't that basically the same exact thing that I just did here? Here's sine y over r. Again, on the unit circle, what do we know? The radius is 1. And that's why it was just equal to the y-coordinate. And that's why we could visually talk about 
this is the sign ratio for a particular T value and so forth. We could literally see it on the unit circle, but it was only because the radius was one. And again, I won't go through the whole thing here, but cosine would be the X value over one. Okay, X over R, which of course, again, because it was the unit circle and the radius was one, just made it the X value. And then dot, dot, dot right down the line there. Okay, so again, this is just applying this beyond the unit circle, beyond a radius of one. But our values still hold, that is the key. And we'll get to that piece on the next investigation. And then real quick, maybe just applying it to the right triangles as well. You guys wanna go ahead and just draw a quick right triangle right here, something like this. Let's throw just a little theta in. This was our other visual representation of some of these ratios. And maybe throw in an opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse, of course. And I won't overplay this by any means, but if I asked you for the sine ratio in a right triangle, you would tell me opposite over hypotenuse. Could you picture this on a coordinate plane? This would be the vertical, right? There's the vertical, so it's Y. This would be the direct, so this would be the R. So you could see opposite over hypotenuse if I expanded that to a, um, a coordinate plane, would literally be y over r. Cosine of theta, of course, was adjacent over hypotenuse. And again, you can still think of that. Even as we go through the motions here, you could still really work with these right triangles if you know these pieces. And again, if you look, think about this as like a coordinate plane, isn't the adjacent side sort of the horizontal distance or the x? and the hypotenuse would be the direct distance, which is R. So this would be X over R. So you can see that these, again, sorry for being redundant, but geez, are just an extension of these representations right here. Okay, perfect. Now, if I asked you for this investigation coming up right here to tell me what the sine of pi over four is, you would probably think about the unit circle and you would say square root of two over two because you could visualize the y coordinate as root two over two on the unit circle. So sine of pi over, t uh, pi over four is root two over two. If I asked you for the sine of 45 degrees, obviously just same angle, just different unit of measurement, you might think of right triangle trig. And you might say, oh, I remember this from constructing special right triangles. The opposite over hypotenuse with a 45 degree angle is root two over two. Absolutely. So. Both representations obviously produce the same approach. Now let's go ahead and be complete with it. Well, what does it mean when we talk about sine of pi over four or sine of 45 degrees? Well, I'm gonna have to come over here because I'm out of room down on the bottom. But basically, here's the idea. I'm gonna go ahead and draw a huge terminal side there. This would be pi over four radians or 45 degrees. And what it's basically saying is if I was to pick a point anywhere on the terminal side of a 45 degree angle, the Y value divided by the R would be exactly the square root of two over two. Could you envision that on the unit circle? Could you envision that in right triangles? Absolutely. This is for any angle, no matter where we are on the terminal side the y over r is exactly square root of two over two. I could do that there. I could pick any point. y over r is square root of two over two. I could do it right in here. y over r is exactly the square root of two over two. I hope that makes sense. I want that to be pretty clear because trigonometry is really based on ratios. It's not the size of the right triangle that we create here. It is the ratio that produces this value. Okay, I won't belabor the point too much, but hopefully that kind of clicks and we can move on to the next piece. So just some basic examples that come up with this to really reinforce our six definitions at this point in time. So let's start with example one. It says, find the six trig ratios or trig functions of theta if point negative two comma three is on the terminal side of theta. Perfect. So everybody, a lot of drawing comes up with this particular curriculum, so let's get this going. Negative two comma three, right there. Excellent, and we have a terminal side going through that particular point. Everybody draw it if you would. 
Now what we want to get comfortable doing is creating our horizontal distance, our vertical distance, and our direct distance. So what I want you to do at this stage is actually from that negative 2 comma 3, I want you to go ahead and draw right on down to the x-axis and create yourself what we would call a reference triangle, if you would. Okay, so what we're basically saying is the horizontal distance from the origin to that point would be this. The vertical distance from the origin to that point would be this. And the direct distance from the origin to that point would be this. If we can label all three parts, we've got our six ratios hands down. So just remember one component and then we'll get into it. Direction matters in trigonometry. So what I mean by that, when I talk about the x here, I know this is two units going from here to here. I definitely know that. But because we go to the left, please make sure you include a negative on that too. All right. Now, because I'm going up vertically, then this would be up of three. And I think you could do the math pretty well here, but just remember if you have two pieces and you need the third, this is the relationship we created on the previous notes worksheet. So you can see a little Pythagorean theorem, x squared and y squared make r squared. So when I do this, of course, negative 2 squared plus 3 squared equals r squared. So obviously, if we're going to write all six ratios, we, we don't have r just yet, but we can get it. So 4 plus 9 equals r squared. And I hope you see that r is equal, equal to the square root of 13. By the way, R is always positive. So see if you can fit that in there. I didn't draw that great, but R is square root of 13. R is always positive. Just make sure you do remember that, at least in the rectangular um, system. We'll be looking at another system um, a little later on this semester where R is either positive or negative. But for right now, again, sorry for, don't want to confuse, R is always positive. Okay, let's not overthink this sine of theta, just y to r. The y to r ratio here would be 3 to root 13. Sine is y to r. Please rationalize if you would. So multiplying top and bottom by root 13, 3 root 13 over 13. Perfect. One down, five to go. Cosine of theta, everybody. If you look on your sheet, of course, again, we start to really know these well, x to r. Negative 2 to root 13. So again, every angle has six ratios that correspond to it, and those are based on x, y, and r. So negative 2 root 13 over 13. Absolutely awesome. Tangent, the other primary one here, tangent of theta is the y to x ratio. So here we go, 3 to negative 2. So that would be negative 3 halves, 3 to negative 2. All right, I'll pause for just a sec. Hopefully you don't have any issues on those three final values on the primary trig functions. Let's go get the reciprocals. Again, it needs to be a little more automatic in writing them. We want it quick, we want it perfect, all good stuff. All right, so cosecant, reciprocal of sine. So remember, uh, sine is y to r. Cosecant, everybody, is r to y. So root 13 to 3. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. If cosine is x to r, then secant is r to x. So root 13 over negative 2. So negative root 13 over 2. And last but not least, cotangent is x to y negative 2 to 3 ratio, so negative 2 thirds would suffice. All right, really, really nicely done. Now just one thing to note, and I won't belabor the point here, I promise. Just remember what we did on that previous investigation, and here's what I guess I'd say. Let, let's just pick one at random here. I'm going to just do the sign. I'll do the unsimplified version right there. So basically we're saying for the position of this particular angle, let's bring this over here, for this particular angle, the sine ratio is 3 over root 13. And just to get an idea of numerically what that would be, a little about 0.83, et cetera, somewhere in there, right? 
So if I was to take the Y value over the R value, it would produce this number right here. The question I have for you is this. Could I pick a point anywhere on the terminal side, and if I figured out what the Y to R ratio is, would it always be this number right here? Would it always be that 0.83 and change? Absolutely. And that's the idea. This terminal side goes through a particular point which we used, but could I have picked any point on that terminal side and would the sign ratio be identical to what we calculated right here? Again, just in terms of a decimal approximation, would it be this right here? Yeah, and that's the point. Okay, it's all based on the ratio of y to r. And as long as this stays in the same position, that y to r ratio is going to be constant. And for this particular angle, whatever it may be, is, it's this right here. And that goes for the other five ratios as well. Now, as to what theta is, that's for a little later in the game. Okay, cool. Let's go get the next piece. So what we really want to get comfortable with is where things are positive and where things are negative around the coordinate plane. Got to really know these well before we can take that next step. So investigation, the signs of each of the six trig functions in the four quadrants. And uh, what we're going to do is draw a coordinate plane and determine the signs of sine, cosine, and tangent in all the four quadrants. Obviously, guys, if we know the, the signs, positive and negative, of these three, then we probably know the signs of the other three. They're just reciprocals. If this is positive, that's positive. If this is negative, its reciprocal is negative. So reciprocal means flip, but the sign is the same. All right, so let's go ahead and just do this piece right here. Everybody, if you would. There we go. And what I want you to do is, you could do sine, cosine, tangent. I'm just going to do S, C, T in all four quadrants, sine, cosine, tangent. And what I want you to do is pause the video for a moment and just put a little plus or minus next to each. Do you think the values are positive or negative in that particular quadrant for that ratio? Well, let's see maybe how you did. So I hope you kind of came to the conclusion that the Y to R ratio in quadrant one would always be positive. Y is positive, R is positive, so positive. Cosine is positive. X to R, definitely positive. Tangent, also positive. Y over X, so everything is positive in quadrant one. Again, if you're ever unsure about any of this, just ask. Be happy to look at it with you. Now, sine in quadrant two. Think about this. Is the Y value going to be positive or negative in quadrant two? Positive. And when I divide that by a positive R, it's positive. So sine is positive, but everybody, what about cosine? Negative, because the X is negative in quadrant two. Negative X over a positive R produces a negative number. And as a result, tangent has to be negative two. Y over X will be negative in quadrant two. Excellent. Let's go do these two right here. Sine, now that we're below the X axis, that means the Y values are negative. So sine is negative. Cosine is negative, so we're still to the left of the origin there, so cosine is negative. But what happens when we divide a, I'm sorry, a negative y divided by a negative x? We get a positive ratio. So tangent, guys, happens to be positive in quadrant three. Make sure you know that piece. And then last, sine is negative. We've moved over to the right side of the coordinate plane, so cosine is positive. And when we take a y over x here, it's negative. So do you happen to notice a quick pattern? In this one, they're all positive, And in the other three, it's only one out of the three that are positive from there. So we'll do this a couple different ways. But here's how I would write it. Quadrant one, they're all positive. In quadrant two, sine is the only one that's positive. The others are negative. In quadrant three, tangent is the only one that's positive. The others are negative. And in quadrant four, cosine is the only one that's positive, and the others are negative. So out of the big three, sine, cosine, tangent, you see that in these three quadrants, one is positive, the other two are negative. And there's a little mnemonic device to kind of remember 
all sine, tangent, and cosine as you make your way around here. Again, we'll kind of work with this continuously. So all students, there's your sign, take, there's your tangent, calculus, there's your cosine. All are positive in one, sine is positive in two, the other's negative, tangent's positive in three, the other's negative, cosine's positive in four, the other's negative. All right, so let's obviously do an example to reinforce exactly that concept there. So two parts, let's do 2A and 2B, and let's see if we can pull it off. Let's draw a little coordinate plane. So here's what I have about theta. It says for part A, tangent of theta is less than zero. So what I want you to write just above the less than zero here Less than zero obviously means negative. Okay, if, if tangent is, uh, of our theta is less than zero, that means that the tangent ratio of theta is negative. By the same token, if it says secant of theta is greater than zero, well guys, greater than zero means that it has to be positive. So less than zero, negative, obviously greater than zero, positive. Well, here's what I would ask us to do. Look at the coordinate plane and let's just focus on this piece right here. Which quadrants is the tangent ratio of theta going to be negative? Okay, look up here, think about all that. Where is tangent of our theta gonna be negative? If you look closely, based on this, all are positive here, tangent's the one that's positive here, that means tangent is negative in these two right here. So what I want you to do is put a little check mark in quadrant two, check mark in quadrant four. So what that basically means is at this point in time, tangent of theta is negative. So theta could be in either two or four. I'm not sure. So what I need is one more piece of info. And guys, I come right over here and I know something else about theta. The secant ratio of theta is greater than zero. Now guys, we only talked about the primary ones, but we didn't talk about those secondaries, the reciprocals. But the fact of the matter is, if secant is positive, then its reciprocal, which of course is cosine, is also positive. So that's what I want you to write right below that. As soon as you see the word secant, actually what you're really thinking is cosine. And cosine is positive, everybody. So. We know that theta is either in two or four. Which of these two quadrants, everybody, is cosine positive? Well, again, if you look right here, it looks like we've got a winner. So this one has to be it. That's the only one where these two overlap. And so as a result, quadrant four is our answer. Awesome. Be great if you could think about letter B on your own. I'm going to go ahead and just get a coordinate plane even before writing it. Um, let's see. Well, let's read it and then write a couple things down as well there. So a couple steps to this. So if cosecant of theta is less than zero, so that means cosecant of theta is negative, and cotangent of theta is greater than zero, so that means the cotangent ratio is positive, Determine the sine of cosine of theta. All right, so we probably have to figure out the quadrant first, then we could kind of talk about the sine of cosine of theta. Let's figure out where we are. Okay, let's get it going. As soon as you see cosecant, I want you to think of sine. All right, so the sine ratio is negative. What we've been really doing from day one with trigonometry is anytime you hear the word sine, think about y. Where is y negative? definitely below the x-axis, so sine is negative down here, quadrants three and four, so I know theta is either in three or in four. I don't have enough info. So then I go to the second piece. As soon as I see that cotangent is greater than zero, then the tangent ratio of theta also has to be greater than zero. So where is tangent positive? Well, tangent is positive, obviously, in quadrant one, although we're not focused on that. 
where else in terms of three and four, which one is tangent positive in? It's positive in quadrant three. There it is. So it looks like our angle, our theta, is in quadrant three. So let's put that right here. We are in quadrant three, no doubts. That's the only one where sine is negative, tangent's positive. And we got that based on the reciprocals of these guys. So what do we know about cosine of our theta in quadrant three? Okay, when I hear cosine, I do think X. And if we're in quadrant three, you know, we're in here, the X is negative, so cosine is negative. And that's our answer. All right, you can get really comfortable with that piece. Where things are positive and negative, got to make it happen. Very cool. Well, let's take care of example three relatively fast here. This feeds off of example two. Example four, we'll do just a little investigation with it and fill in this beautiful table. And then we'll wrap it up with a couple things just towards the bottom there. All right, you guys are doing great. Let's keep it going. So, example three. It says if sine of theta is equal to negative 5 thirteenths and cotangent of theta is greater than zero, you know what, right away, guys, I'm going to just, in my mind, as soon as I see cotangent of theta greater than zero, I also know tangent of theta is greater than zero. That helps me there. Find the values of the remaining five trig functions. So we have one, obviously. Sine of theta is negative 5 thirteenths. Let's go get the others. Now, I'll be saying this a lot over the course of working with trig, but draw a diagram, no doubt about it. Let's draw. So let's figure out where we are and go from there. So everybody, sine of theta is equal to negative 5 thirteenths. So the sine ratio of this angle right here is negative. Where could that be? One, two, three, four. Where is sine negative? Well, as soon as I hear sine, I'm just, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking about y. And y is negative down here, so sine is going to be negative down here. So either in 3 or 4. We need more info. Ah, and here it is. Tangent of theta is positive. So out of these two, because we know we've narrowed it down, which one is the tangent ratio positive in? There it is. So we know we're in quadrant 3. So we draw an angle in quadrant 3. That'll be my theta right here. You don't have to put that in if you don't want. But basically, what I need to do now is go right to the horizontal axis and make what we would call a reference triangle. So everybody, that piece right there. And notice what happens when we draw that. We have a little reference triangle. I have my x, I have my y, and I have my r. That's perfect. Okay, now remember everybody, something to something. That is this ratio right here. One value to another value. That ratio in this case, if we're talking about sine, is y to r. Write that in right there if you would. Now, one thing that I do right off the bat is if I have an r, I put it in and I know without question it's positive. r is always positive. So, how did I get this negative 5 thirteenths here if r is positive? Well, the y value, of course, has to be negative. And that makes sense vertically. I'm going down. So I've got a negative 5 to 13 ratio on this particular um, terminal side. Guys, we do a little quick, quick, quick Pythagorean theorem. I need x. x squared plus negative 5 squared equals 13 squared. If you do this, and I'm running out of room here, negative 5 squared is 25. One, uh, 13 squared is 169. When I subtract that over, I get x squared equals 144. And by the way, this happens to be a perfect square, so when I undo the square, here's what's interesting. When I undo a square, I was always told, and I've always told students in an equation, you're supposed to take the plus or minus, of course, right? But in this case, it can't be both. So we don't want to do plus or minus 12 here. We want to do one or the other. So I would ask you, if we're going in quadrant three with our terminal side, is that x value positive 12 or negative 12? And it has to be negative. And that'll be the key, really, to do well with some of the higher level stuff in trig. 
it all comes from making sure our diagram is, is played out properly. So X is negative 12. Okay. Hey, guys, it's ready. Let's go get them. So cosine of theta is X to R. X is negative 12. R is 13, so negative 12 thirteenths. And obviously, cosine had to be negative because we're in quadrant 3. Tangent, y over x, negative 5 over negative 12. Hey, everyone, what happens when we take a negative divided by negative? It becomes a positive ratio, so 5 to 12. Excellent. Uh, cosecant next. Cosecant is just the reciprocal of sine. There was sine given in the problem. Flip it, negative 13 fifths. Secant of theta. Secant of theta is the reciprocal of cosine of theta. So how about negative 13 twelfths? Last but not least in this set, cotangent of theta. Again, x to y or the reciprocal of tangent. Again, so many different ways to kind of think about it, but really negative 12 to negative 5. Negative over negative is positive. Do the signs match up to the way we would have thought if we're in quadrant three? Absolutely. Sine is negative, which was given. Cosine's negative. Tangent's the one that's positive out of the three. And then the reciprocals follow the same suit. Huh, very cool. So guys, I was thinking of doing a really in-depth investigation on example four, but just kind of looking at the time here. And I'll still show you a couple things with this, but I want you to get comfortable not with just some of the particular values of sine, cosine, and tangent, but I do want you to be able to basically understand the behavior of these values as the angles change. So this is a key thing for us to take our next step, but rather than spending a ton of time on it, we'll probably just gloss over a couple ideas and fill in the table. All right? Well, here's what I have for us. So what I want to think about is what happens when the angle is zero um, zero radians. What is the sine of zero? What is the cosine of zero? What is the tangent of zero? And then what happens when sine changes, when we start moving our angle from zero to pi over two? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it increasing or decreasing? What's going on with sine as we go through? What, what's going on with cosine as we go through? So here's what I actually came up with. Did a little drawing myself here on my sketch pad. And notice what I have. I've got an angle right here, and every angle has the three components, x and the y and the r. And what I want to do is kind of explore what happens as the angle changes. So here's, here would be an angle of zero, basically, right there. And then I'm going to start just going around. The angle's changing. Here we go, zero to pi over two, pi over two to pi. Yeah, let's catch that etc., etc. And then right down the line there, what's going on with these values as the angle moves around one rotation? And notice what I have here, of course, our definitions, sine ratio y to r, cosine ratio x to r, tangent ratio y to x. So real quick, and again, I'll just kind of show you a couple things. Let's see if everything matches up. Notice what sine of zero is, zero. Cosine of zero is one, tangent of zero is zero. We know that, of course, from the unit circle and some other explorations. As I kind of go around, take a look at, at the values of the ratios. They're all positive in quadrant one. Look at sine. Is sine going up or down? Going up. It's increasing. What's going on with cosine? Cosine's going down. Tangent's going up. Look how fast tangent's going up. And then look what happens when I move into quadrant two. Look what happens to cosine and tangent. How cool is that? Cosine and, ta uh, and tangent become negative. Oh, let's get that piece. There we go. Look at that. Sine stays positive, but it's going down. If you ever want to take a look at this with me, I have it on the, the hard drive of my computer. You're more than welcome to kind of explore it in greater detail. But look at those values. Pretty cool, huh? In quadrant three, notice co uh, sine and cosine are negative, tangent's positive. How cool. Quadrant four, look what happens. Tangent and sine are negative, cosine's positive, exactly what we would expect. 
So why don't you be able to see this in a more dynamic light? Um, wanted more time with it, but I, I also don't want to spend too much time with uh, this stuff. So let me see. Let's get back on. There we go. Perfect. So long story short, um, let's just fill in our table and go from there. So sign, guys. Sign of zero is zero. In that first quadrant, sign's positive. It's increasing. It peaks. Sign of pi over 2, as we know, is 1. Sign is positive in quadrant 2, but it starts to go down until we hit pi and sign of pi is 0. Then we get into the negatives, and it goes further down, all the way until it hits its trough down there at 3 pi over 2, and the, the minimum there would be negative 1. And in fourth quadrant, negative, but it's increasing until we come back to 2 pi, and obviously it repeats that process. So sine of 0, same as sine of 2 pi. So kind of cool. I want you to really keep in mind that piece. Again, if you want to look at my um, pretty good sketch pad drawing, you're more than welcome to at any point. Cosine, similar in nature, a couple variations on it. In that first quadrant, of course, it decreases as opposed to increases. And cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Then cosine gets negative in quadrant 2, and it's decreasing all the way down until we hit pi, and cosine of pi is negative 1, as we all know. Quadrant 3, definitely still negative, but it's increasing. It's coming back until we get right back up to 0. And then in the fourth quadrant, it's positive and increasing until we get up to positive 1. So I'm definitely concerned more with sine and cosine. We're going to really unwrap this idea in the next several days. Tangent I don't care too much about. Let's just get this in there. Tangent is 0 is 0. Positive in quadrant 1. Remember at pi over 2, it's undefined. In quadrant 2, it's negative. Happens to also be increasing, by the way. And in, uh, at pi, it's 0. Quadrant 3, what's interesting is quadrant 3, it's positive. And then remember when you hit the bottom of the unit circle at 3 pi over 2, tangent becomes undefined again. And in the last piece, guys, quadrant 4, tangent is negative, still increasing, by the way. And we'll see this unfold again over the next several days. Cool. We'll get that in, take a look at it. And as I said, if you want to look at it in more detail, I'm happy to do that with you. All right, last piece, guys. It's just a prelude to the next lesson, which is reference angles. Um, I'll be pretty quick with this piece. So it says, we will evaluate trigonometric functions of positive angles greater than 90 degrees and all negative angles by making use of what are called reference angles. Reference angles, everybody, are always acute and always positive. So I underline that piece, maybe highlight that as well. Always acute, always positive. Alrighty, so it's always just getting used to these angles and their ratios as many ways as I can to develop that with you. That's, what, that's my job. All right, example five. All I need to know is, is it possible for these angles to be reference angles? Just is it possible? Acute and positive. Why don't you pause it for like 60 seconds, try to fill in all 10 there, and I'll fill in my answers. Okay. Here's what I came up with. 32 degrees is definitely acute and positive. 89.6, definitely acute and positive. This is definitely not acute. 357, definitely not acute. Pi over 6 would be 30 degrees, so that is definitely acute and positive. 1.2 radians is acute. So remember, pi over 2, which is 90 degrees, is about 1.57. This one is certainly um, below 1.57, so it's, it's acute, no doubt. 2 pi over 3, that's 120 degrees, so that's going to be a no. 3.1 radians, that's almost pi radians, that's too big, so that's a no. And wow, these guys, they're negative, so no right away. So again, when I ask you for a reference angle, always acute, always positive. Cool. So, um, 
just again a prelude to the next lesson. Last piece here is to do the investigation. It says drawing an angle theta and its reference angle. So here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do, just off to the side here. Give me an initial side. Give me a terminal side. That'll be our theta. I'll rotate it from there to there. Now the reference angle has to be acute and it has to be positive. The best way to see that, guys, is to take any point on our angle and go right to the horizontal axis and create what's called a reference triangle. And what you will see, of course, is a nice acute angle in a, tri in a right triangle. So we're going to think of this as acute and positive, and as a result, that's going to be our reference angle. We're going to call it theta prime. That's the reference angle right in there. We're obviously going to do a ton with this in the next lesson, so don't fret too much about it. Just get that in play if you would. I'm just going to draw the conclusion right up here, and here's what I would state. Draw a perpendicular segment from a point on the terminal side always, always, always to the horizontal axis. Never, ever, ever to the vertical axis. So always to the horizontal axis, just like I did here. Perpendicular, right on down to the horizontal axis and create your right angle. Okay? And then the reference angle, of course, is between exactly the two things that you would think of, the terminal side, and, of course, the horizontal axis. Got it. Terminal side is here. Horizontal axis is here. There's your reference angle. There's theta prime. That, as you can probably see, is the title of the, um, the next lesson. So we'll take it from there. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening.